Hello, welcome. I'm happy that everyone is here at this presentation. My name is Stefan Elbing, and I am a deaf person. I come from Germany. So I'd like to explain to you about Project Huron. And first, I'd like to tell you where the name of the project comes from. This project, or the name of this project, developed from a Catholic saint. In the past, the language used for the religion was very difficult. The average person could not understand it. So Haran translated that so that the, pers the people were able to understand it into a language that was easily comprehensible. Well, that relates to people who are deaf, because deaf people can't understand spoken language and therefore need an interpreter to use sign language to understand. That's where the title is from. So when we think about inclusion, we think about uh, people who are deaf, people who are blind, people who have various disabilities. Hearing people often think or interact with those people by excluding them. But instead, people need to be inclusive, as we know. Hearing people might make decisions for the disabled, but instead, they ought to have people who are disabled involved in those decision-making processes. In Germany, we see that there are, uh, we see that in, within Article 11, we have this obligation to include the disabled in the process of preparedness. It is important that we include people with all types of disabilities in that process and that we consider them in the planning. Um, you can see the various articles listed, and two of those articles are especially related to inclusion, to accessibility for all people. We see that in Article 9. Uh, it's important that people have accessibility, not only people who have mobility difficulties, but people who have communication difficulties as well, that they have access to interpretation. And that relates to all of these articles. When you have people who are deaf or people who are in wheelchairs, we often think of them as, uh, as people that must be cared for. We think of them as people who, uh, who, for whom decisions must be made. But instead, we need to allow them to make their own decisions about where it is that they want to go. They should not be forced into, into places or forced into decisions, but they must make their own mobility decisions. When you think about people who have visual impairments, they are isolated from objects. They can't see things. But when you think of people who have communication impairments, people who are deaf, they are isolated from people. Instead, they must be included. They must be a part of the communication process. So in the, in the face of disaster, we often have audible announcements. And that's no problem for people who can hear. That, that's important for disaster preparedness. But what are deaf people going to do if the only warnings are audible? How will they know? It's important for people who are hearing to consider deaf people in this, uh, this possibility, to think about their warning signals, to think about interpreters for them so that they have access to the information in sign language as well. In Europe, there are two million people who are deaf. The World Federation of the Deaf thinks that there are somewhere between 
tw- uh, about 20 million, I'm sorry, 70 million people in the world who are deaf. In Germany, there are 80,000 people who are deaf. And there are 16 million people who are hard of hearing. And of many of those people lose their, uh, their ability to communicate later in life, and 70% of them then depend on sign language interpreters. So, in order to address these needs, I have developed this uh, way of getting material to people, to all people, and it's accessible to all people, barrier-free. So online, you'll often see information that's written in very complicated language that people who are deaf have a very difficult time understanding. The information um, is then inaccessible to those people who are deaf. Here is an example of how information can be made accessible through sign language. For example, information about natural disasters could be made available to people through sign language so that those people are able to understand it. This is essential. Whenever you have various events, it is important, essential that you have interpreters at those events. So you must keep in mind the communication needs of people who are deaf when planning those events. When disasters occurred in the past, we saw symbols like the ones on the right. But instead, we need to move to symbols like the, like the, I'm sorry, we saw symbols like the ones on the left, but we need to move to the ones on the right, where we think about inclusion for people who are blind, for people who are deaf, so that deaf people know what, what, uh, uh, what they have. For example, simplified language that's easier for people who have um, language difficulties to read, expressions in sign language, accessibility in all these ways that you see uh, in the logos. As I uh, mentioned before, materials must be made available. And this slide just uh, makes reference to how Hiron does that. So you must think twice about hospitals and um, the accessibility for all people in those disaster situations. You must educate those people who work in emergency response so that they understand the needs of people with visual impairments or communication impairments so that they are able to understand their needs. You must think about that. So you must, whenever you're, you're giving information, always make sure that that information is barrier free and that you do not forget about the needs of people who uh, have problems having accessibility. I know that I'm moving very quickly. I apologize to my interpreter for how quickly I'm having to speak. So with phone accessibility and emergency service numbers, uh, that is available only to hearing people, but it is not, has not traditionally been available to deaf people. And so, as I was working and have worked for several years, I've worked to understand uh, how it is to make this information accessible to deaf people. And this information is then accessible throughout Germany, and it's direct accessibility to people who are deaf for em- emergency and disaster preparedness. But I I encourage other people, not people outside of Germany, to also take advantage of this technology. The information related to a person's health, a person's disability, is downloaded into this app. And then on this app, um, whenever an emergency person is called, all the information is already available. And they have all the information about the person when they arrive on site.
And this technology is available to be used globally. It's not limited simply to Germany, it's not simply for deaf people, but it can be used for many people German, in, uh, throughout the world. We developed this in Germany and we have been using it for some time now and the German deaf people, the German blind people, the, the people uh, throughout the disability community are very happy that this is available to them as accessibility in emergency situations. Uh, you know that you have the emergency number that you can call um, for emergency uh, problems in your area. Deaf people have not been able to have accessibility to that, but now we have a particular number that is available so that if emergency personnel receive information from the app, they are able to get information so they can communicate whatever it is that they need quickly with this number. So people who are blind, uh, people who are deaf, people who have various disabilities may be sleeping, and this app will actually communicate that an emergency is happening to them. This is something we're expecting in the future. It's not available. So the app can communicate with, for instance, a watch that is worn to warn the person that a disaster has happened, even if they're unable to hear it. So as we continue to think about applications in uh, the future, we need to realize that uh, disasters are occurring at all times and dis uh, disabled people are already experiencing these and thus we must think about them now. So you must think about the various issues for people who are deaf, people who are blind, people who have mobility impairments as a way to include them and recognize their dignity. And uh, this information shows you how that's done in the application. Now, onto another issue, um, the co cooperation between uh, me in, in Germany and uh, colleagues in Italy have yielded this result, Prodigy. Prodigy is a vo virtual reality software that people are able um, to use in order to understand the experiences of uh, people who are disabled. So if, uh, for example, um, a person is in, uh, needs to, to, to um, have mobility problems, they can put the virtual reality uh, software on, wear the virtual reality headset, and understand what it's like. And they can simulate disasters with the virtual reality information, and thus people can plan for people who have disabilities. So you can see the virtual reality software being worn by this woman. This was first developed in Italy uh, as a means of instructing people on the, the lives of people who are disabled. The virtual reality uh, software is continuing to be developed and is going well as we work to understand the various um, situations of people and as we learn from the various disasters, problems that we can put into the software and simulate. I wanna thank you so much for um, coming and for watching my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the interpreter.